welcome to episode 124. Are you ready for the adventure of a lifetime? No matter your destination, the travel specialists at 3D Travel Company are there to help. Just head on over to my website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and click the Book Now button on the left-hand side to get your free quote today. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hello everyone and welcome back to the show. Today's special guest is not a voice actor, but is a television, comic book, and book writer uh, of many different things from Malcolm in the Middle to Shrek 2 to many, many, many more topics that we will talk about on today's episode. So I hope you guys enjoy learning about how scripts get turned into books, books turned into scripts, and how comic books can change the world. I hope you guys all enjoy today's special episode with our very special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Who Did That Voice? In just a moment, the show will begin. So, so please, please sit, sit back, back, relax, and, and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice? Today on the show, we have Emmy winner and Emmy nominee, Tom Mason. Tom, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. Uh, my pleasure, Trenton. So, Tom, the very first thing we always like to do when we have a special guest on the show is just to get a little background on who they are. So, who was Tom Mason, the young boy that grew into the man and writer uh, he is today? Oh, you didn't tell me there'd be these trick questions going into my background. <laughs> well, I, I, here's the easy answer. The easy answer is that I am the kid that sat behind you in class and whispered jokes to you where it made you laugh. And then the teacher got you in trouble, and I got away scot-free. <laughs> wow. I am still that guy. I found, I found a career that allows me to still do that, to make snotty comments, to make funny jokes, to uh, make fun of stuff, and earn a living. And uh, the only difference is that nobody gets set in the hall now. Yeah. <laughs> now that you're all grown up. <laughs> That's right. There's, I, I own the hall, so I don't, uh, I don't have to go out and sit in it. Well, you sound like me. I'm a big kid at heart. And, uh, you know, I love animation to this day. And, uh, you know, so it's fantastic that you've been able to be a part of those things. So tell us, how did you de develop your skills as a writer? And how did you break into the industry to actually become a writer for comic books and animation and TV shows and, and the like? Well, here's, here's the stupid answer to everything is I never started out to do any of that. Wow. Um, I'd all just sort of fell into it. And then I thought, hey, this will be <laughs> this might not be such a bad thing. Um, I started out when I was in college. I was a cartoonist. I was a, uh, drew cartoons for the college paper. Oh, wow. And I thought, okay, I'll do, this will be the thing I do for the rest of my life. Yeah. And then, you know, there is, <laughs> it turns out that there is no market for cartoons like that anymore. Yeah. And so, um, you know, once magazines disappeared and uh, once you realize that you'd like to have significantly more money so that you can actually do stuff. Um, <laughs> cartooning is not a, uh, a good career. And so then I became, uh, I was an art director for a publishing company, uh, Fanagraphics in Connecticut. And then they moved to California. And then I ran, I met a guy named Dave Olbrich at Fanagraphics. And he said, listen, I'm, I found this guy. He's going to back a comic book company. Do you want to come along? And I said, sure, because I knew how to make comic books. He knew how to make comic books. So we ended up starting what became Malibu Comics. And so I was just going to be like an editor, creative director, art director kind of guy. Yeah. And still wasn't writing, still didn't do any of that stuff. But I ended up doing tons of like solicitation copy, advertising copy, and promotional copy, print ads, all that kind of stuff. And a couple of comic books sort of fell into my lap where the original writer backed out or didn't want to do it or couldn't do it. And so I ended up filling in and I thought, this sounds like fun. So then I started writing, <laughs> I started writing my own comics that were published by Malibu Comics. And it just sort of, I found that I liked that a lot, but I also liked being in the business of comics. And so I would just, I had this like split personality where I would work in the business of comics during the day and write comics at night. And then when I left Malibu Comics, I thought, hey, I'll start to write TV shows. And so then, and then a guy I knew at Malibu Comics who was the head of business affairs 
said, hey, I know an agent. And I said, well, that's great. Can you put the two of us together? And he did. And so then I got an agent without really trying too hard. And then I started, <laughs> then I started writing TV shows. So everything just sort of spiraled into this uh, snowball effect of one career after another that I just sort of fell in. Wow. And took advantage of the opportunities as they came up. Well, that's fantastic. So it's not even something you necessarily strove for. It's just kind of doing the daily thing and it just more and more things kind of fell in your lap as you progressed through life. Yeah. And then I, and I, it turned out that I liked those things. That's and awesome. I had, I had some kind of knack for it and I had a lot of people around me. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't the isolated writer living alone in his cabin working on his creative manifesto. I had, you know, people in the office, I had friends, I had all kinds of people giving me advice and help and nurturing me along the way. And so, you know, it, it couldn't have gone any better. So I'm, I'm not the person to emulate. <laughs> because, because what happened to me and what I did, I don't think can, well, this sounds really egocentric, but I, I don't think it can be duplicated because every time I give this speech about how did you get your start, people just look at me with like their mouth open, like how, how can that ever happen to somebody else? <laughs> well, it is definitely a fascinating story because, you know, I don't think a lot of people just fall into their careers, but the opportunities that happened to come your way were just fantastic. And that's, that's really cool. Yeah, I was in, I was in the right place. I knew the right people. I was friends with the right people. I think if I'd started out as a teenager going, I'm going to break into comics and then I'm going to use that as a stepping stone to break into television, I would have had a really hard time. Yeah. Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known what I was doing and I would have just been one of the thousands of people that just banged their head against the wall going, let me in, let me in, let me in. And then I just sort of set this thing up where I walk in. Well, sometimes it's our life experiences that train us for what we need in the future, whether we know it or not. And that's a very good point. I, <laughs> I agree with you completely. Um, I know you even got to work with Marvel Comics and do uh, you were the VP of marketing there, I believe. Yeah, what happened is that um, uh, Marvel Comics eventually bought Malibu Comics before DC could buy it. And then um, because of that, I became a vice president at Marvel Comics sort of just because. It was, <laughs> I, I, it's another one of those things. I didn't earn it, but because... Marvel bought the company that I was working for, and I had the marketing position at Malibu. They just said, okay, instead of giving you money, we'll give you a new title. Well, and so that works, I, said, I guess. <laughs> okay, I'll, uh, I'll be a vice president at Marvel Comics now. So that was, that, that was my official title. But I wasn't – the funny thing is I was never in charge of anything that was Marvel-related. I still was the marketing guy for Malibu Comics. It's just my corporate title was Marvel. <laughs> That's funny, but it makes for a great title, you know, and a great story, you know, so yeah, it does. And it, it, when I go, when I go places outside the industry and I say, oh yeah, I was a VP at Marvel comics, you get a lot of long looks like, okay, how did that work? Yeah. <laughs> they're like, how, tell me about that story. And you're like, well, and they're like, what? <laughs> well, it, yeah. If I tell you the truth of that story, all the credibility goes away. Yeah. It's yeah. it's better if I just tell you I was a VP at Marvel Comics and then I leave to go to the punch bowl. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that guy's a VP at Marvel. Right. And then <laughs> always always leave too soon. Don't over explain. Oh, oh, I see someone I gotta go see bye. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's another VP over there. I gotta go uh we have to go talk VP stuff. That's funny. Well, you know, as far as writing, I know you've worked on some awesome animated projects, Max Steel, uh, Totally Spies, and Avatar. That was the last airbender, right? Did you work on that? Oh, yeah. One? Well, those, I, those were the books that I did. Those weren't the shows. Oh, those were the books. Okay. Well, those were shows that became animated uh, yes. or books that became animated, but you were able to write on those as well. So that's fantastic. And how did you get involved with those particular works? Wait, here's the funny thing is that um, I've had a writing partner for a number of years and we had we were in the middle of a television writing career downturn we spent the better part of like nine or ten months without any work coming in there was no and then we hadn't done anything bad it was just the, the business was in a slump and there wasn't any work to go and nobody we were sort of far down on the pecking order of who you call and so there wasn't enough work to get to, <laughs> to, get to our level yet <laughs> okay. and so, and so we had, and we had an agent. We were still going out on meetings. We were still doing stuff. We just couldn't get any more traction. And we had just come off doing two shows where we were the, the showrunners. Oh, and wow. so we were in a good position to get more work. We just, it just wasn't there. And so then we had um, 
a producer that we had worked with before was uh, best friends with an editor at Scholastic Books. And he called us up and he said, listen, I'm going to recommend you to my friend at Scholastic Books. She's looking for a writer or two writers who are really good at being smart asses. <laughs> and we said, yes, that, that, yes, that is absolutely us. Please, we can be as smart ass as you want. <laughs> and um, he said, and we said, please, you know, but just tell us what it is. And he said that Scholastic had gotten the rights for Malcolm in the Middle to do books based on the TV show that had just come out. Oh, wow. And he said, do you have any book samples that could prove that you're a smart ass? And we said, no, we don't. But how much time do we have before she calls us? And he said, I don't know, maybe a week at the most. And so I ran down into Hollywood. And this is when you could still do this. Now it's online. But I went to a place called Larry Edmonds Book and Poster Company on Hollywood Boulevard. And he had copies of the pilot script for Malcolm in the Middle on sale for like 10 bucks. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so I bought one, ran back to the office. And then my partner and I started working on a sample of what that pilot would look like if it was turned into a kid's book. And so sure enough, like three days later, the editor from Scholastic called and we had a great conversation. And then she ended it by saying, so do you guys have any samples that prove that you can be a smart ass? And we said, yes, we just, <laughs> it just so <laughs> happens. We have a, a sample of Malcolm in the middle that we did based on the pilot script. Would you like to see it? And she said, yes. And then, so we sent it over. And we got, she read it and she said, this is great. I'm going to send it over to the studio, 20th Century Fox, and see what they think. And that got us the job writing the Malcolm in the Middle books. And then, of course, as you know, once you do something, the other stuff sort of falls into place. So then we started doing a lot of Malcolm in the Middle books for Scholastic, which led to doing other books. Um, and then the Malcolm in the Middle people wanted us to do not adaptations of their scripts. They wanted us to come up with some original story ideas and do original books. So we did that. And then they liked those so much, they wanted to bring us in to work on the TV show and adapt some of our book stuff into episodes. So we did that. And so then we got back into television based on that. And then we started a second career writing children's books all based on that. So that's where our path sort of led to more television work followed by more book work. Dang, that's so awesome. <laughs> you guys just have this like circling um, career that just kind of like one thing can kind of snowballs into another and rolls into another thing. And that's just, that's super awesome. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then what happened is the scholastic people that we work with, they went elsewhere. So one person ended up at Simon and Schuster and then another person ended up, um, well, I forget the name of the company. But then they started calling us and saying, listen, now I'm over here at Simon & Schuster. You want to do something for us? And so we said, yes. And that's, that's how we got the Avatar books. And that's how we got um, the Monster House book. And that's how we got uh, a couple of other things. Oh, wow. Tom, that's awesome, man. So it's just like, you know, one thing after another led to another thing. That's just super amazing. <laughs> well, the, the, trick, the trick is we, we never said, you know, we never said no to anything. Yeah. And we never said, um, we always recognized what was an opportunity. And so if, if stuff came to us and we were like too busy or whatever, we would still say yes, because we knew that by the time the deal was negotiated and we could actually start, it was going to be a month, six weeks, two months, six months before we could actually do the work. And by then we, wouldn't, we weren't going to be busy again. Yeah. We just sort of saw the opportunities and tried to predict the future schedule. So that if we said yes, we'd get the job. Because, you know, once you say no, they stop calling. Yeah. And we didn't want that. Yeah. If you say no, they definitely stop calling. That's for sure. You got to keep saying yes and just make yeah. it work. <laughs> We've turned down stuff. We have turned down stuff where we were too busy. Yeah. And we have turned down stuff that we didn't, we didn't like and we didn't think we were right for. That hasn't harmed us. But we have, we have to choose very carefully how and why we say no and what we turned down. Well, I think you should definitely turn your, your life into a script because I think it, it would make a fantastic movie because, you know, just being able to fall into some of these things one after another, it's like, Holy cow, man, that is so unrealistically awesome. Well, it, it, it helped too, that I was in for the bulk of this time. I was in Los Angeles. Yeah. So could, 
you know, you, you network, you meet people, you hang out with people and everybody is sort of, you know, right there. I think if I was in, uh, I don't know where you are, where are you? I'm actually in Oklahoma city. Yeah. And no offense to that, but if I was in Oklahoma city, I think I would have a much harder time getting books published and getting TV shows on the air. Oh, I, I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> Yeah, and then I think then I would just be like the guy you see around town. I wouldn't be, <laughs> I, wouldn't be I wouldn't be a writer. Well, I know you've actually got to work on Lazy Town Nick Jr. Were you actually writing scripts for that show or were those for books as well? Yeah, I went over I went over to Iceland and um cuz that's that's where they had filmed it. They had um the guy who created the show um Magnus was uh he based it on a uh a live action production that he used to tour around Iceland with and go to schools and stuff. Okay. And he pitched it to Nick as a TV show. And then a friend of mine was the story editor and he called, <laughs> he called me up one day at the office and said, Hey, listen, I'm running this show with a mix of live actors and puppets. And, um, do you want to go to Iceland? And <laughs> if you say yes, then we leave in 10 days. And so I said, well, yes, <laughs> I think when a, uh, producer or network or whatever says, Hey, we're going to send you to, to a foreign country and we're going to pay all your expenses. Do you want to go? You pretty much say yes. <laughs> and so, and so my partner and I went to Iceland with like three other writers and we sat in the studio and in the middle of January. And if I, I didn't know this because, you know, I'm ignorant of the rest of the world, but it turns out that Iceland in January is not known for its daylight. And so the studio would send a car that would pick us up in the morning and it would be dark and it would be dark. Like it would be eight o'clock in the morning, but it would still feel like midnight and oh, wow. they would drive you to the studio. We'd work in the studio. We'd go to the cafeteria and have lunch and you could see the sun sort of rise and set during lunch. <laughs> wow! And so then by the time you got off work at six and they take you back to the hotel, it still felt like midnight again. Wow. And it was cold and whatever. But that was, a, uh, that was a crazy show. So we were there, I forget how many days we were there, like eight or nine days, every day working on the show, pitching ideas and working on scripts and talking to the actors and the puppet people. And then we would go back to L.A. and work on scripts and then submit them to the studio in Iceland. Oh, wow. So what was it like going to Iceland? I mean, was that pretty awesome for you? Or Yeah, it was great. The, uh, the, you know, you're, you're trapped in the studio and you don't see a lot of Iceland. Yeah. But uh, Magnus drove us around one day to show us all the stuff. And we had a day off where we went to the, uh, the, uh, the hot springs, the thermal, whatever it is. Yeah, they're gorgeous. I've seen pictures. Man, it's awesome. And the, um, you know, what, <laughs> what I remember, I'll, I remember two funny things. They were both happened in the studio. Okay. During, during one of the, uh, the pitch meetings where we're sitting there throwing around um, ideas, the, and it's, it's the five or six of us writers and it's one of the producers and it's Magnus who's the star and the creator. And in the middle of us pitching out ideas, this woman comes in dressed as a nurse and we didn't know if this was like some weird cosplay or if this was a real nurse or what was going on, but she had a tray of stuff with her and a little nurse, nurse's uniform. And as she comes in, Magnus stands up and starts taking off his shirt. What? And we, yeah, exactly. And so we're all looking at each other like, what sort of weird Icelandic custom have we stumbled upon that was not in the brochure? <laughs> it was not in the Wikipedia entry. And she's, she takes this little tray of stuff and it apparently has creams and lotions on it. And so while Magnus is talking about what he wants to see on the show, He's got his arm up in the air and she's rubbing these creams and lotions on his arm. And it turns out that he's so white from being in Iceland where there's no sun that he doesn't show up well on screen. And so they're, <laughs> they're bronzing him wow. in, the middle, in the middle of the pitch meeting. They're bronzing him and he's still talking. That's so funny. <laughs> and that was great. That was, that, was, that, that was really weird. And wow. so then... We did a uh, we did a table read on one of the other days where the writers come in and the actors come in and everybody reads their lines and the writers take notes about what works and what doesn't whatever and the uh, I think there are two 
there were three human characters and the rest were puppets. And so the puppeteers came in and they brought their puppets with them. And so they would read the lines through the puppets. And we weren't, we weren't allowed to talk directly to the puppeteer. We would have to talk to the puppet <laughs> then, who would then answer us if we had questions. And so that was, that was also weird. Because yeah. Never. I mean, the guys, the, the puppeteer's right there. I'm looking at him. I'm right next to him. We could we could share a straw if uh, if we wanted to, but <laughs> I, I can't talk to him. I can only talk to the thing on his arm. Wow, that is very unique. <laughs> yeah. well, that was that was good. I uh, if if you ever get a chance to work on an Icelandic puppet show, I think that's that's what you should do. Absolutely. I'll jump at the opportunity. Yes. Yeah. Please never say no. <laughs> well, Lazy Town was so unique and so wild and just, you know, visually it was very stunning and just, it was, I thought it was so unique from what, you know, we've normally seen on screen. And uh, I don't know, something about it captivated me. I know it wasn't really meant for an age range of, you know, mid, mid age teenager to early twenties. Uh, but it just really kind of, I don't know, popped out to me for some reason. So we always thought it took a while to get a handle on the show, but the thing we thought of is this is like an, an HR puff and stuff kind of show that somebody made in the late sixties and they just now found. <laughs> yeah. Once we wrapped our heads around that, it became a really sort of fun show to sort of figure out and, you know, work with the characters. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you got to be a part of that because it was a very unique show and uh, to know that you had a hand in, in what we got to see on, on screen was awesome. Um, you know, there was a project that I was looking into that you'd worked on. I'm probably going to butcher the name, but it's called Sean Koo Diaries. Oh, yeah, that one. That's, I don't even think that's been made yet. The, <laughs> okay. um, the, what happened is that the um, – and I get, I get a lot of these calls because I, uh, I have a, a small reputation as like a fix-it person. Okay. And so um, a producer friend of mine had the screenplay already written and – he had a studio in India that was anxious to make it, and it's based on a children's book by uh, oh, I'm gonna I forget the guy's name, I'd have to look it up. And but a very famous Indian writer, it's one of his best known children's books. And he said, "Can you take a look at this? Because I don't know what it's about." And so I read it, and then we had a meeting, and I said, "Listen, I don't know what it's about either. I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to come on board and say yes, I can fix it, but I don't." really understand what happens especially in the third act when all the pieces are supposed to come together it just seems weird and random to me yeah and he said well that's great because <laughs> that, that means we both can't be stupid and so <laughs> um i said he so he hired me to come in and sort of rework it in a way find the elements that make sense and sort of restructure it in a way that would lead to a satisfying uh, conclusion and it was a supposed to be an animated feature and I think it was supposed to be direct to video although there's no direct to video anymore so it's probably streaming at some point and I had to write it in 10 page sections because the animation studio had already done pre-production designs that I couldn't change so I had to use what was already done and I had to write it in 10 page chunks every I think every 10 days I had to deliver 10 pages until I was done so that the animation studio could just one, two, three, go. Okay. Because the, the at that point, you're writing to the schedule. So making it bite-sized so that they can work on it according to their schedule and everything. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. I know that must be a little bit hard for you sometimes coming into a project when you want to have more uh, play with it and then you're kind of more restricted. Does that make it more difficult for you as a writer or do you find the challenge interesting? No, I find I find that to be fun. It's as... as it's as close as I'm ever going to want to be to being a doctor in the ER. Okay. <laughs> because the, I've, done, I've done stuff like that in the past on a smaller scale. When I was starting out, one of my first jobs, they did the voice recording in Toronto, and I was in L.A. And so I would come to my office, and I would get there like at 9 o'clock. And I knew, I learned, every Thursday there was going to be a message as soon as I walked in from the studio in Toronto because it was noon there, and there'd be, the message would be this. Can you take a look at lines 38 and 39 in the script we're recording today? Um, we've had a lot of trouble with the joke, and some people don't like the joke. So we're going to lunch now, so can you get us six alternative jokes for each of those lines by the time we come back? 
And so, <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, sure. So then you <laughs> you sit down, and everything else for the morning sort of goes away. And now I have to write, you know, six new jokes that can fit into the same into the existing story. And I have basically forty five minutes to get them and send them over to the studio in Toronto before they come back. So that was one, and that was really good training. And then um, the second one, I was on another Nickelodeon show called The Fresh Beat Band. Okay. So I would be, there were four of us on the writing staff, and I was usually the on-set writer, which meant that during rehearsals and during um, shooting, I would be the guy on the soundstage who could help if there was a problem. And so if, a, if an actor kept stumbling over the words or if something didn't play right or if a joke didn't work or if the setup on the stage didn't match the one that was in my head when the script was written, then they would call me down and I would have, you know, X amount of seconds to sort of, you know, pitch a new joke or help the director figure out a different way to stage it so that it was still funny or, you know, we can't rent a tuba, so somebody got a piccolo, and so I have to address the, the change in the prop or whatever. And so it was just, you're really just sort of thinking on your feet wow, um, as, as fast as you can in front of a crew. There's you know, usually 100 people standing around waiting for somebody to come up with, you know, all right, who's got the joke? <laughs> wow, that's actually more work than I would have ever imagined, but that makes sense. Yeah to have a writer on set. That's wow. Yeah. I appreciate you diving into that. <laughs> no, that was, it was, it was fun. And I, I really liked it because it's, if you're a writer and they're down on the set and somebody, usually the director, um, but occasionally the first AD would call up and say, listen, we need Tom to come down to the set and fix something. That's <laughs> you, you, there's no, I don't know. There's, for me, anyway, it was just thrilling. It's like calling Batman or something. Yes, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> I couldn't wait. I would grab my pen. I'd grab the strip, the script, and I would race down to the three floors of the stage. And you know, everybody turns to you to try to fix it. And it's uh, if you can pull it off, it's great. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I believe you actually got to work on Shrek too as a writer as well. Is that correct? Not the movie, but the book. Okay, the actual book. Okay. Um, some of the things I wasn't quite sure if it was the actual book or, or the show, but uh, it was cool that you were able to be a part of that as well. Shrek has always been a, a, an absolute fun story to uh, to watch and read. And and that was another thing about um, the connections is that that came from Scholastic Books. And oh, it, really? And the editor, the editor that I had worked with on Malcolm in the Middle had had moved on, and her assistant had moved up into that job, and so she remembered me from the Malcolm in the Middle books, and then when the Shrek two book that movie adaptation came out. I think it's called the movie storybook. She called up and said, hey, listen, we have a really tight deadline. Can you take this 100-page screenplay and turn it into a 36-page uh, storybook? Yes. <laughs> so is, is it hard for you to take a, a large script and condense it down like that, or is it pretty easy, or what would you say? Well, it's neither easy nor hard. It's just it's an interesting puzzle because you have to take what is suitable in the script that can be in a children's storybook, which is sort of younger than the movie should be. And you have to still tell the story of the movie, but in a lot fewer pages and leave room for a lot of pictures. So you don't get, you don't get many words. So you have to go through and it's really just cutting out the things that you think aren't really necessary, which is always hard, but still keep the tone and the intent of the original script and still sort of find, you know, cause they're going to read it in Mike Myers voice, or they're going to read it in donkey's voice, or they're going to read it in Pinocchio's voice. And so you have to still be true to what everyone understands exists. And it's just, it's like a giant puzzle. It takes, it's nothing you can do overnight because you sort of have to sit and sweat all the different pieces until you, you put it all back together again. Absolutely. Well, it's kind of like trimming the fat and keeping the meat in the real essence of the meat so that you have that left for the children's book. Right. And you still, it still has to resemble Shrek too. It can't be, it can't be something else. What is this? <laughs> right. Be, I've, I've cut out all the parts in the movie everybody loves and here's the other stuff. And you're like, wait, this has nothing to do with the movie. <laughs> you, you can do that. You can easily, you can take almost any screenplay and recut it into something that was not 
intended. Wow. And so the, it's, it's judicious editing plus being familiar with the property and the characters and having enough time to sort of puzzle it out. Oh, well, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It definitely sounds like a challenge, but for you, I think it's something that you rather enjoy since you've been in this career field for a long time. <laughs> well, I, I do because the great thing is it's already written. Yeah. And so all I'm doing is condensing and sort of reworking and fussing with it. Yeah. I'm more, I'm more of an editor at that point than I am a writer. True. I didn't think about that aspect. Well, you know, I know there are a couple of different awards I wanted to talk with you about. You have several awards, um, but there was an Emmy nomination for uh, Outstanding Children's Animated Program back in 2007. And then in 2009, you were an Emmy winner for uh, Outstanding Writing in Animation. What was the nomination and the win for in uh, 2007 and 2009, Tom? 2007, I was part of the writing team for Todd World. The story editor was uh, Karen Greenberg and who I like working with quite a bit. And she got me on Todd World as a writer. And then um, the whole staff, myself included, got nominated for the writing Emmy. Oh, wow. And then we lost to that stupid aardvark, Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I hate that guy. And, um, but that was the first time that I'd ever been part of the nominating process. And then two years later, I was the... My partner and I were story editors on a show called Word World, which was where um, the characters in the show were actually made out of the words in their name. So Duck was made out of the letters D-U-C-K and Cat was made out of the letters C-A-T. I remember that show. Yeah. That was and awesome. So, I liked it a lot. It's, it's, it's fun. It, yeah. Because the hard part is trying to figure out you know, how many words you can make out of just three or four letters. And so we were the story editors on that show. And then um, and the writing team... Uh, got nominated for that as well and so that time there was no Arthur to contend with <laughs> and so we uh, uh we 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 took home the gold that's awesome well Tom thank you for sharing that because I remember that show with the words and the characters were the words and I was like who came up with this idea it is so unique <laughs> anyway, there was a guy uh Don Moody it was his idea and because uh, he was the producer creator of the show yeah and um and then he he met us through another producer and brought us on board to um sort of help him realize the uh how to do it well tom thank you so much for your time today man i've got two final questions and we are going to wrap this up excellent ask away what is your social media and how can people reach out to you <laughs> whether they have questions about writing or maybe they're wanting to hire you for a new project um, well, let's see. What is the uh, what is the best way? Well, the easiest way is the only way you'll find me is I'm on Facebook. Okay. Um, because I don't have an Instagram and I don't have uh, a Twitter feed. I don't have any of that stuff because I'm not. Uh, well, I have no time, and so I just I just keep a Facebook profile. And I think there's probably like a hundred people with my exact name. So you know, good luck <laughs> finding me. Um, <laughs> And I think that's the, uh, that's really, if anybody wants to find me, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Okay, fantastic. So look for Tom Mason on Facebook. Yes. And Tom, the last question I have today is, what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I was not expecting that. Um, I have no idea. I think the legacy is that, you know, because we're all, for the most part, we're all forgotten once we, uh, once we're in the ground. Yeah. So I don't think, because you know, how many how many writers really from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s does anybody actually remember on a percentage basis? We remember like the biggest names, but we don't remember because I'm I'm like firmly in like the wedge of the middle of show business. I don't think I don't think I have a legacy like, well, he did he did great work. We're all we're all very impressed with Mr. Mason's ability. I don't think that is the, uh, the, <laughs> the legacy that I'll leave behind. I think it is that I am I I've never been arrested <laughs> and um I I left I will leave behind uh two good children who will hopefully be adults by the time I croak <laughs> and, um that I will always I think my legacy will be oh I, yeah he's that guy <laughs> well, you know, I think besides the career that you've had, you know, family is one of the biggest legacies any person can leave behind. So I think that is absolutely 
what you know most people are going to leave behind is a legacy of family and children uh and that's fantastic you know but the career that you've had has definitely impacted people in ways they may or may not know and hopefully this show will help them get to know you better so maybe the legacy you leave behind will last just a little bit more uh permanently in in history's notebook well thank you and uh, keep your show on the air for a long time too so it has a, it has a tendency to have that effect absolutely the longevity of anything can help uh uh, everyone in the long run, you know, the long, it's the long tail of the internet. Nothing ever goes away. Absolutely. Very true. Well, Tom, thank you so very much for being on the show today. It has been an absolute honor and pleasure. Would you just give us a closeout today as we wrap up our episode? Hey, this is Tom Mason for who did that voice. Thanks for joining today. And uh, please don't call me because I have a script due tomorrow. Well, everyone, I sure hope you enjoyed today's episode with Tom Mason, the television, book, and comic book writer. And if you did, please find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram by searching Who Did That Voice. And don't forget to like, comment, and share. For those of you listening on YouTube, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button, and don't forget to hit the little bell notification button on the right-hand side so you don't miss out on a single episode. I've been your host, Trenton Larkin, and I'll see you next time. You know, a question you might ask yourself is, where can I listen to Who Did That Voice? That's an excellent question. You can hear us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, YouTube, and our website at www.whodidthatvoice.co. Click the Episodes tab and listen away. Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for this episode. Join us next Friday for our special guest, David Coburn, the voice of Captain Planet. You won't want to miss this episode. Hey, do you ask yourself, who did that voice? Well, if you do, go to our website, www.whodidthatvoice.co, and click on the Episodes tab. Choose an actor, pick their name, and see pictures from the different characters they've voiced in their career. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice. <laughs>